Okay, we're good to go. All right, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Dennis Feldman. I'm with Instaresa, and you are joining us for the second installment of the Face the Future webinar series. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank those of you that joined us last month and uh, apologize for some of the kinks that we had to work out. I was a little nervous and it was the first rodeo. So uh, anyways, we got everything ironed out. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. A uh, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, this will be recorded and we'll distribute the recording uh, hopefully within uh, the next few days. So you'll have that uh, to share with folks that weren't able to join. Also, there is Q&A for the webinar and you don't have to wait till the end for the Q&A. If you go to the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a little icon with a triangle, a square and a circle. That's the activities button. Click that and then that will bring a pop up up that you can select Q&A. Feel free to type your questions as we go. And uh, when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll have a chance to review the, uh, the question and answer. So with that being said, we have a very special guest this evening. Uh, he is an oral surgeon and has been touted by friends as a wealth of knowledge, which I love to hear that. And he'll be sharing with us tonight. Uh, he's a graduate of The Ohio State University, went on to Loyola University of Chicago Medical Center to study uh, oral surgery. And then he's been in private practice ever since, was an owner and a uh, instructor with Clear Choice. And currently he is faculty at Case Western Reserve and is teaching implantology to the lucky folks at the VA Medical Center. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest this evening, Dr. John Brocklov. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate you having me this evening. Uh, good evening, colleagues and residents and friends and whoever else is on. And uh, let's see if we can just get this presentation going, okay? Again, uh, friends and colleagues, thanks for joining me tonight to the second Instaresa webinar. Uh, this is meant to be a casual affair, much like if we were just sitting around the office uh, discussing cases. So please message in the message box if you got any questions or comments. Uh, basically, I'm going to try to divide this discussion into uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative categories, and then uh, just go over some tips and tricks that are meant, some of it for all on X or all on four type surgery. And then some of it also applies to all, all implant uh, type surgery in general, okay? So let's get started with tip number one. Again, uh, my name is John Brockloff and thanks for joining us tonight. So uh, the title of this is Tips and Tricks for Full Arch Surgical Procedures and Surgical Success. And uh, that's lower right picture is just kind of me showing off. Uh, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a big fan of osteotomes and uh, I'm a big believer that osteotome gets you a nice uh, torque and uh, when you have torque, it's highly correlative, correlative to uh, osteointegration. So it's kind of a funny picture there. All right, so um, let's start off with tip number one. Tip number one is terminal dentition, okay? Terminal dentition is a subject that is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, so let's go over the def definition. Uh, terminal dentition is the state of mouth, teeth, and gums uh, where all or the majority of the remaining structures are at an end or near the end of a functional lifespan. And uh, so that's a definition uh, that fits a lot of things that we do today. And uh, I have to thank Dr. Charles Babish uh, because Charles, Chuck Babish and myself, we coined this term in, in late 2008, early 2009. Uh, and that actually happened after I was dismissed from the Northeastern Ohio Cleveland Dental Association for showing slides. Uh, and yes, we had slides back then, slide carousels um, of tilted implants, and then also for extracting teeth uh, that the dentists in the dental society uh, deemed salvageable, right? These guys thought, hey, if these teeth are salvageable, you shouldn't take them out to just put in implants. Now today in 2024, we don't really think the same as that. You know, We don't think twice about slicking an arch of teeth um, to put in a whole new arch of implants. Uh, but back then in 2008, uh, that was a no-no. And because of that, I was uh, dismissed from the Dental Society. So interestingly enough, we came back and uh, Dr. Babish and I, Clear Choice, we coined this term. We actually still own the um, rights to that term. And, uh, and the best part of it is that as of October, 2022, 
uh, terminal dentition is now a uh, official medical dictionary term. And then it also has its own ICD-10 code, which is K08.89. Uh, and so if you happen to be using uh, medical insurance for uh, uh, trying to get payments for implant surgeries, which is actually becoming more common today, you have to use the uh, code K08.89, which is um, you know equal to terminal dentition. All right. All right, so next bullet point. Uh, oh yeah, there's a picture of terminal dentition. I'm sure we've all seen gross things like this before. All right, so uh, our next bullet point is that the terminal dentition requires a diagnosis, okay? A diagnosis is a very important part of all on X surgery. Um, if you do not have a diagnosis or you do not have a diagnosis written down, uh, that is a bad thing, and that can get you in a lot of legal problems. So it is important to document prior to surgery in your chart notes or your forms um, that the patient to your diagnosis is terminal dentition. And another point that's really important is have the patient sign the diagnosis uh, form. Uh, you know, it says, you know, Dr. So-and-so, uh, your this is my diagnosis for you for patient X is terminal dentition. And that's why we're going to take out all your teeth and put in implants. Uh, it's a very important, and uh, it can save your license and your dental career. Uh, so before you start any all-on-X surgery or all-on-X case, make sure you notate, notate the terminal dentition diagnosis boldly, uh, and also have the patient sign the form that says that you told them that. And then uh, lastly, remember, uh, this is something that uh, the dental boards will look at, okay? So if you have a case that goes south all right somewhere along the line uh, somebody's going to look at your chart notes or look at your uh, um, notations on your CAT scans or your cbct that also should say terminal dentition and uh, if you have that written down you're probably in good shape i actually am treating or working uh, on a case right now uh, where a dental board uh, looked at a gentleman's cases and found them to be unacceptable uh, but good fortunately for him uh, he wrote down that the patient had terminal dentition and had the patient sign it. And uh, he's probably going to do just fine um, And because he was documented. I, I, they are trying to hassle him, even though he has a documented uh, diagnosis of terminal dentition. But uh, since he wrote it down, he's probably going to be in good shape. Okay. All right. So let's look at a little quick analog case, uh, a ter basic terminal dentition case. Uh, I believe this case is from 2016. Uh, he happens to be a 56-year-old male smoker. Uh, who happens to have a toothache on the upper right, and he presented requesting new teeth uh, in preparation for his daughter's wedding, which was in four, four months. All right? All right, so this is a little bit older case, probably about eight years old, and uh, here's a pano and a basic uh, clinical frontal picture. Um, and this is what we would look at before we got started. Uh, by the way, Instaresa has some uh, really new, uh, brand new anatomical retractors, and they're really good for facial scans and bite scans and good for clinical pictures, such as the one you see on the right. Um, I'm sure Dennis, at the end of this uh, webinar, will have a, a code that you can get for a uh, discount on the new uh, retractors that we use for pictures just like this, all right? All right, so trick number one, uh, priorities are what, all right, for this patient? Priorities are what? Priority number one is to remove the painful molars. Again, I'm gonna say that again. Remove the painful molars, okay? Um, this is one of the first priorities, to remove the painful molars. Why? And I, and I usually try to do this. Uh, typically, I, I try to schedule removal of painful molars right after I do a full arch case. And then sometimes I'll even have uh, a full arch patient actually talk to the patient who I'm take, preoperatively taking out a painful molar on so that the next patient coming up gets to see the patient that we did today. And so on my uh, schedule, I think the, maybe even tomorrow, I'll have an upper all and X case at maybe 8 to 10 a.m. And at 10, 15, I'll have an extraction of a molar or a bicuspid or whatever tooth is given uh, the next patient coming up in a few weeks uh, pain. And uh, why do we do that? Well, extractions for pain relief are a uh, priority, okay? Dental boards will absolutely look at your notes about this. And remember, uh, all on X surgery is elective. 
all on X surgery is elective. So if you just go do all on X surgery and don't take care of the acute problems first, uh, if by chance anything goes south, the dental board will look at that very unfavorably. Okay, so uh, let's look at tip number three. Okay. Um, I like to have a patient rinse with mouthwash uh, for a full 60 seconds uh, prior to beginning any all on X surgery. Um, and it has been proven uh, without a doubt to increase osseo integration rates by about 1.8%. And um, how I know that that's proven is that Dr. Babish and Brockloff at uh, Clear Choice, uh, over the course of about seven or eight years, collected some data. Uh, so this was Clear Choice internal. Uh, data and the current literature was about 13,000 arches. Uh, that's about 52,000 implants. And we uh, figured out that uh, uh, anybody who rinsed out with 60 seconds of uh, any kind of mouthwash uh, had about a 2% increase in integration rate. Uh, I actually don't think it really matters what type of mouthwash you use, whether it's Listerine or chlorhexidine, or in this case, this picture is just Colgate Broxidil. I don't think it's the actual medication you use. I think it's the 60 second wash that uh, decreases the bacterial load inside the mouth and that helps prevent acute uh, implantitis and early implant failure. And, and I will tell you that as a gentleman who has done upwards of 350 arches in a year, uh, that's well over 1300 uh, implants in a year. If you save approximately 2%, that is a lot of time and effort and uh, energy that you will not have to expend on removal of uh, implantitis implants, uh, grafting, and replacing. So every little bit counts, and it sounds like the silliest little thing, but uh, a 60-second mouthwash can really make a big difference. All right. All right, so let's go back to our case. Now you can see that this slide demonstrates several things. Uh, we've removed the uh, upper molars on the upper right and uh, gotten him out of his toothache, and now he's ready for his upper all on four prior to his daughter's wedding. Okay, so let's move through the surgery. We're not here to talk too much about that, but uh, this slide demonstrates several things. Uh, one is proper incision design uh, with uh, papilla sparing reflection of the flap and a nice thick KG there. Um, and then you can see that the fixtures are placed in a proper palatal uh, location, and then the most important thing here is that these fixtures are placed in a trapezoid box sort of uh, positioning. Uh, and interesting, you see the arrows here, uh, the blue arrows. Uh, this is where the haircut procedure, uh, which we're going to get Taco a little bit about here in a minute. Uh, the haircut should be for proper closure of the soft tissues. Um, you know, some guys like these running uh, Texas uh, sutures, some of my colleagues. I personally am in, a, uh, in favor of interrupted sutures for this kind of a case, um, but I don't think it really matters what kind of sutures you use. As long as the end of the sutures, you have uh, nice tight knots. And uh, I try to remind my residents to tie knots at least five times, maybe even six, because uh, we don't want any getting loose. So more importantly, tie tight knots, and then uh, I think you'll be in good shape. The picture on the right is me, uh, and uh, that's up at Lake Erie. Uh, outside of, you know, just north of Cleveland where I live. And that is approximately a four pound walleye. Uh, walleyes are really good white fish uh, and they make really, really good tacos. Okay. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so now our finished case uh, is looking pretty symmetrical. Uh, and this is an analog case that we did, but you can see our midline is on and our implants look pretty good. And, um, just to be aware, there's a lot of Facebook posts, posts that are out there that show uh, very perfect uh, implant placement and perfect restorations. And I use the word perfect in quotations, of course, uh, because really to be sure about the implants, you need to show somebody's face. And in this particular case, I did uh, get permission from this gentleman and I had him sign a release uh, to, for use of his images. And I've been using this guy's face for uh, going on eight years now. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, let's go back to our horseshoe haircut maneuver, that, which was part of the last case. This slide uh, uh, demonstrates um, a post that I put on the implant exchange back on 2002. Uh, hopefully many of you out there are uh, 
uh, frequent visitors to that site. I believe that that's the best implant uh, closed Facebook group in the world. And um, this particular post was about the horseshoe haircut. And um, in this particular case, uh, I used uh, Nobel soft tissue heel caps, uh, which are pretty wide. Um, they're also shaped like a mushroom. Uh, they happen to be 4.6 millimeters wide by 5.5 millimeters tall. And again, they're shaped like an umbrella. And uh, so when you put those on, you can see very easily where to trim, trim the tissues, trim the tissues. And, um, and then the uh, slide on the right uh, is the actual Nobel part numbers. Uh, 300166 and 300167. Um, they're nice uh, Nobel uh, soft tissue caps. I actually think there's a better option today, uh, which is, happens to be sold by Instariso. And uh, I'll explain that, why that is here uh, in the upcoming slide. Okay, here is a good pick of uh, what location needs to be trimmed with the uh, horseshoe haircut maneuver. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can use to actually do this maneuver. Uh, I personally just get a fresh 15 blade and uh, a long pickups and then kind of cut a little horseshoe around the inside of the uh, wide, tall healing cap. And I've heard of people using Takahashi scissors and uh, sometimes even people use tissue punches, but uh, I just use a 15 blade, a fresh one, by the way. All right, so now you can see after you turn it back, uh, you get that uh, nice KG sitting flat on the paddle aspect of the uh, fixture in the heel cap, and uh, that's your horseshoe haircut. Okay, let's go to another case. This is case number two. Uh, we're going to call this a semi-guided Instarisa style case, uh, also with a horseshoe haircut. Uh, I am a very big believer in these, uh, what I call semi-guided cases. Um, these little semi-guides can be uh, very easily made uh, with ExoCAD software and a, and a little drill. Uh, they're very inexpensive, just a few dollars. And then most importantly, they're highly effective. So cheap and effective is always good for me. And uh, we'll see what we got going here. All right, now, so here's our semi-guided uh, piece of plastic, clear plastic. Uh, this slide kind of shows me uh, planning the trimming of the thickness of the semi-guide uh, at whatever desired height uh, you think your restoration should be. You know, in the old days of analog, we always went 15 millimeters, um, but today we probably don't need to go that thick uh, with uh, resins such as Onyx Tough or Rodan Sculpture. Uh, these restorations are getting just thinner and thinner and thinner uh, as the resins get stronger and stronger and stronger. And um, yes, yeah, so you can trim it back. And uh, one interesting feature for these semi-guided clear guides is that you can just take a little drill and drill a hole in the pallet uh, in preparation if you need to use an, an Instarisa Ant ARS screw. Uh, the ARS screw is a fiduciary screw that Instarisa recommends for their workflows. Uh, so you can align uh, uh, facial scans and uh, CBC scans and intraoral scans. And so in this case, you can just you know, drill a hole up in there. And if you need to put an ARS screw, you just put your bite uh, guide in and then you can have the patient bite down. Now, in this particular case, I did not use an ARS screw. I just decided to uh, keep the cuspid number six, uh, and I used that cuspid as a reference uh, to the earlier scans, uh, so there's no ARS screw, but we just kept uh, cuspid number six. And you can see now, as we move along in the case, that this guide, when you have the patient closed down, uh, is in a nice, good occlusion. Uh, midline looks pretty reasonable. And then uh, as you pull back the superior flap, uh, you can take a good old Home Depot pencil. Uh, when people come to classes at my uh, office in Ohio, we pass out Home Depot pencils. And then this is just a picture of, you know, the pencil mark across the maxillary alveolus at the edge of the guide, showing you where to trim back the bone. Uh, yes, we yes we use Home Depot pencils. A little bit crazy, but that's what we do. All right. Now, once you have trimmed the bone back, you can place your implants uh, in a box formation uh, and then uh, you put on your uh, Instarisa scan bodies. Remember, Scandar is a product used uh, in the uh, uh, workflow for Instarisa where you want to use pick up the uh, implant coordinate positions. Uh, I'll have to be a little critical of myself here. I probably should have cleaned some of the blood off of that 
because uh, remember blood uh, causes distortion on intra intraoral scans. Um, but uh, now you can, you're ready here to take your uh, final uh, coordinate scan with uh, TRIOS. And uh, once these four fixtures are uh, coordinated, you can align them to your previous scans and, uh, and then you can create your restoration. Okay, so now uh, once we've taken our uh, coordinate implant uh, scan, uh, we wanna put on our heel call, Healy caps. I actually like the industry's uh, now uh, FP3 uh, heel caps. Uh, they're really quite wide. They're wider than uh, 5 point, or, uh, 4.6 millimeters wide. Uh, and then uh, if you notice, there's a, a little notch on the top of them there. Uh, you, there's another technique where you can use short scan body and just uh, take a scan that way too. We didn't do that in this case, uh, but there's a feature at the top of the uh, FP3 there that can be used for uh, uh, a short scan body. And then most importantly here uh, on our tips and tricks, you can see on the left-hand side, there's our extra soft tissue. And uh, we're gonna use our horseshoe haircut maneuver to trim that back. And then uh, the picture on the right is uh, what you end up with, okay? So don't forget, uh, uh, I'm in favor now of the uh, FP3 heel caps. They're really quite wide and uh, they do a nice job of uh, keeping the tissue off of the implant platform, particularly overnight. Um, you know, I, I probably did about 2,500, maybe 2,800 um, same day deliveries while I worked at Clear Choice in my career. And uh, over the past few years, uh, I've adopted the next day delivery because I just feel like it works better and uh, if you're going to do the next day delivery, you need a nice wide uh, cover uh, while the patient goes home for the night. And then most importantly, when they come back the next day, you want to have that tissue retracted well so you can engage your prosthesis uh, at the platform level. So keep that in mind about the FP3 heel caps. Okay, so here's our gentleman that we did our Instaresa uh, case on, and this is uh, next day. and. Uh, it turned out pretty well. Again, always remember, show me the face, okay? If, if people show you uh, just the teeth or just the gums, uh, I'm not in favor of that. I wanna see the patient's face. And then lastly here, just a schematic again of the all on four uh, soft tissue haircut maneuver. And you can see in the green arrows where the advancement of the tissue is, and then in the red dots is where the tissue trim uh, would properly be done, okay? And then the picture on the right-hand side is uh, what I like to do in the summertime. And uh, Lake Erie is our home. And uh, the name of my boat is all on four. So fun to go boating. Anyways, right now it's snowing in Ohio, so I'm missing my boat pretty much. Okay, let's move on to tip number four. And again, this is a, one of my favorite uh, pet peeve subjects. And um, sometimes, uh, clients and people that I teach ask me, why do I pre-medicate with antibiotics 48 hours prior to full art surgery? It's not necessary, or sometimes I'll have people tell me that they, oh, I just give a patient two grams of amoxicillin prior to uh, a full art surgery, which I really don't understand that. That makes no sense. Whoever, th that's really good if you have a endocarditis risk, but for a full art surgery where you're trying to get uh, antibiotic at the pla at the tissue level, not the plasma level, at the tissue level. Um, it really takes about 48 hours for uh, molecules of antibiotic to get to the tissue. And, and I didn't just dream this up myself. Uh, the information and the, the uh, protocol for this actually come from, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, from chemotherapy protocols that are uh, quite well known. Uh, and I learned a lot of those when I was a uh, doctor at the Cleveland Clinic. Okay, so the principle that you need to know is called NIC50, um, and the minimum inhibitory concentration 50 uh, will allow your pre-medication for full arch surgery to increase your osteointegration rate by approximately 4%, okay? And again, this is data internal from Clear Choice over the course of uh, several years, and then we published a paper, uh, Journal Oral Maxillofacial Implants 2011, uh, Babish and Brockloff about all on four implants, and there's about 1,001 cases. All right. So, again, pre medication definitely increases your osteointegration rate. So, if you think about what I just said, a mouthwash and a pre medication 
probably up to your integration rate by 6%. Those are two pretty easy things to do. And that makes you uh, have a lot more success. And uh, so I think everybody should be doing that. All right, and this is the principle of minimum inhibitory concentration 50. Remember, MIC-50 is the concentration on a Petri dish that actually kills bugs. And if you notice, the vertical uh, line is time in days, and then the horizontal line uh, is concentration of antibiotic. And as the dosages go up from the left-hand side, dose 1, dose 2, dose 3, dose 4, and as you go up the hill there, dose 5, and then dose 6, at about dose six, approximately, you heat, hit the therapeutic level, uh, which allows you to have the minimum inhibitory concentration 50 to actually kill bacteria at the tissue level. All right. And if you understand that principle, you understand now why giving somebody two grams of amoxicillin an hour before a full arch surgery is pretty much a waste of time because you're going to be at dose one on the far left hand side of the curve. All right. And uh, all right. So this is an important uh, concept. And uh, I hope everybody uh, applies it and does it out in the implant world. <clears throat> and this is why, okay? The principle of MIC-50 can prevent catastrophic Staphylococcus aureus infection. And here's a quick case of something that I have come across. And you can see this gentleman has a, a very significant wound on the face. Staphylococcus aureus is the cause. And it was so wide and so open and so infected that we couldn't even close it at one time. Okay. And so we had to put some zero foam gauze, uh, which is a bismuth tribromophenate uh, type medication, and just leave his wounds open. Notice in the picture in the upper right hand, you can see I have him uh, puckering his lips. Uh, prize for anybody who knows why I'm doing that out in the world. And so this gentleman, we took some cultures, and you can see that the cultures from his massive facial infection include Staphylococcus coagnegative, coagnegative staph, and Streptococcus viridans and gram-positive cocci, which are oral problems. And uh, again, uh, there's a little prize or uh, attaboy for whoever knows why I have his lips puckered in this photograph. But here's his progress over time. His things started to granulate in starting to look pretty good and uh so this principle or this tip or trick i like to like to uh attribute to my old uh grandma maude jacobs uh she was an irish lady with an irish baroque accent and uh she used to say to me johnny i want you to stay out of trouble don't get out of trouble and uh, if you think about it uh, that's what the principle of mc50 does uh keeps you stay keeps you stay out of trouble not to get out of trouble um, and then uh, it's another reason why another tip that I have is that in my practice, and I advise anybody who will listen, uh, that male patients should clean shave, should have a clean shave, uh, clean shaven face when you're doing uh, all on all on X surgery. I realize that's not attainable in all cases. Some people really kick back on that, but uh, uh, if you can <clears throat> get your patients to shave before all on X surgery, that's probably a good idea. Okay, let's move on to our next tip. This little uh, ditty comes uh, from another closed Facebook group uh, that I like to follow, uh, Full Arch Implants All on Four, uh, done by Dan Rosen. And uh, everybody probably knows his uh, Rosen screws and some of his Rosen products, which I really like, by the way. And this particular question on this uh, thread for this uh, closed Facebook group was, what was the timing of the case? which arch was done first, et cetera. You can see that in the lower right-hand corner. And if you look at the picture, you know, this guy has a lot of, of implants. He has two pterygoids, four on the top, and, uh, you know, six on the bottom. So this is a lot of work. And uh, so here's how I would approach this kind of a case. <laughs> Dr. Brockloff, if I had a double jaw case where I was going to put in, uh, you know, 12 implants, first and foremost, I would pre-medicate with antibiotics. And I like to use Valium, either five or 10 milligrams, depending on the weight of the patient, uh, the night prior to the case, so that when they come in, they're nice and relaxed and there are no issues with blood pressure. Uh, I use IV sedation in my office, so, you know, obviously IV medications. And, but then uh, sequence-wise, I always start on the lower arch, always start on the lower arch. And the question is why? Well, you can do your extractions, and when you take out the teeth in the lower art, you can collect bone. 
Uh, we use these little bone collection aspirators for all of our suctions. And you'd be really surprised how much bone you can collect uh, when you extract teeth and then plane down the mandibular bone and then place your implants. And then you've uh, saved that bone and you can mill it in a, a bone mill and store it in saline. And uh, when you have that stored, then you can use it on the upper arch if you need to have any uh, filler done or <clears throat> any sinus grafting or anything like that. So I always start on the lower. And then when I'm done, I always marking the lower because it's easier to keep the lowers uh, number longer. So you don't have to give them as much uh, IV medication. So sequencing why my third thing would be to you do the upper arch and then obviously uh, use the bone as needed that I saved for the bottom. Uh, for any grafting this on the top. And now um, I highly advise everybody to consider delivery of the teeth the next day. Uh, if you utilize uh, Instarisa FP3 uh, cover screws on your on top of your MUAs, they're nice and wide. They keep the tissue retracted overnight and you won't have any trouble uh, delivering your uh, restoration the next day. And I will tell you that the next day de delivery is a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, Talk to me about Dr. Art Morales. And, you know, many, 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 many thousands of these people I delivered and most of them hardly even remember getting their teeth because they were so high on, on medications that we gave them. But if you have them come back the next day, uh, you can really make a showcase of them delivering their teeth and you have their family members there and you can show uh, post you know, pre-operative and post-op pic pictures. And you can record it for your own uh, personal, uh, you know, advertisements in your office. And uh, so, Definitely consider the next day delivery. That's uh, tip number six for everyone. Okay, let's move on to a little bit more sexy of a subject. Okay, um, this picture on the lower right is from uh, Dr. Ramsey Amin, one of my colleagues and good friends. Um, he has a uh, uh, cadaver class uh, for uh, zygomas and pteroids, usually once a year. Um, and I was lucky enough to teach there the uh, last couple of years. And the picture on the top left with the blue triangle is a picture that Dr. Atif Ansari took. And we're going to show a little video here in a minute about that. And, and I do believe that that picture is in uh, Dr. Holtzclaw's book about pterygoid dental implants. So let's, let's talk about uh, pterygoids a little bit and go through a little quick video. Uh, because I think the mystification about pterygoids is is really a, a, a lack of understanding of the anatomy. And uh, so the little video that I'm gonna show, <clears throat> I'm hopeful will clarify your understanding of the anatomy of the pterygoid uh, implant. All right, now remember that pterygoid implants are always placed in zone three. Um, they usually are uh, pretty high torque implants. And uh, the anchorage back there, if you do it properly, can be very, very, very high. And uh, again, my colleague, Dr. Holzclaw, likes to say chingo torque. And I assume chingo torque is probably greater than 70 newton centimeters in most cases. Okay, so remember that the pterygoid implant needs to be placed in the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. The pyramidal process of the palatine bone. And remember, that is right here where my little arrow is going, okay? Right here, okay? And that is the pterygoid, the pyramidal process of the ter of the, ter of the palatine bone. Jesus. The pyramidal process of the palatine bone. So I got a little video here uh, which shows me playing a uh, playing with the, this uh, location. And so the red is where we're going with our pterygoids. Okay, that's the pyramidal process. It's an upside down cone. All right. All right, so here's another video real quick. And this is what you're trying to do when you do a pterygoid implant, all right? You're trying to gotta find the hamular notch, okay? Which is just in front of the uh, medial lateral pterygoid processes, all right? And then this is a quick video. Uh, that'll show you kind of the schematic of what you're trying to do uh, when you do a pterygoid. And then remember here, uh, this periopro is marked for about 20 millimeters, okay? That's a very important uh, number in pterygoid implants, uh, approximately 20, maybe 22 at the most, okay? So watch this video.
That's me palpating where the descending palatine would be. Sideways. Okay. Good. Now remember, this is going to be about 22 millimeters, something like that. Look at your look at your periapron. Yep, about 22 right there. Okay, so that's a very good anatomic. Okay, that's your goal when you're doing a pterygoid implant. All right, now. Obviously, some people get a little worried about uh, bleeding with pterygoids, and there is in the literature quite a few, uh, not a lot, but a few uh, um, very severe hemorrhagic bleeds from pterygoid implants. I think most of those were done by uh, novice people that didn't pay attention to the anatomy. And remember, in the pterygoid implant, the orientation always keeps you away from the palatine artery, okay? The orientation. So if you follow the little uh, video that we just looked back there, and go, uh, you know, along that long axis of the uh, pyramidal process, you will not have any problems with the uh, descending palatine artery. And um, if you follow the length uh, that we, uh, we're going to discuss for just a minute, you will have no problems. You will not get into the terabyte plexus of veins either. Okay. Now, pyramid implants, uh, almost all of them, doesn't matter what the brand you use, whether it's uh, Norris or Strauman or whatever you use, uh, Nobel uh, BioCare or Neodent, almost all of them come in 18 and 20 millimeter lengths. And then most of the drill bits uh, are 18 millimeters. And, you know, if you keep within that number, uh, they'll keep you out of the pterygoid plexus, which sits north or higher up uh, uh, in the pterygoid palatine fissure. Okay. All right. So this is a really interesting video. Uh, this video was shot uh, at the uh, conference that was I showed earlier at uh, Ramsey Amin's uh, uh, class where we accepted lots of cadavers. And um, so I believe it's Atif Ansari, my colleague and a friend from Indianapolis, who's narrating this. And um, we're just going to take a look at the pyramidal process of the palatine bone now, OK? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ansari. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's a real quick review of the pterygoid implant and, uh, and kind of an interesting view of seeing it from the top after a Fort One down fracture of a cadaver. Um, I'd like to leave you tonight. So the gentleman on the left-hand side is a uh, 
a military veteran who has a traumatic brain injury who got some teeth removed. A uh, nice guy, and that's a good sign when they put their thumb up. And then the, the other guy, the young fellow on the right, he's just a regular wisdom tooth case. And um, here's your last tip or trick for the night, okay? The very last one. Um, I use baby diapers as ice packs. Uh, and I've been doing that for 20 some years, 25 years. And we just get little infant diaper packs and we cut them in half and put them into glad bags and put a little uh, water in there and freeze them. And uh, those are great ice packs and we give those to uh, kids on their way home. And uh, that's your last tip or trick for the night. And uh, that's what I got. That's it, Dennis. That was fantastic, John. Appreciate that. Um, I'm looking here at the Q&A. We don't have any questions yet, but before we get to the questions, I've got to ask you, uh, since I don't know, what was the patient with the staph infection, what was the, the uh, puckering of the lips for? <laughs> well, so there's a, a nerve in your face um, and it has five branches, uh, cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, and um, so I was worried that uh, the infection had dripped from, it was a, a transoral infection. And I was worried that it had um, <clears throat> uh, drained out of his face and or injured the nerves that gives you uh, movement to your lips and puckering. So it's a nerve thing. Gotcha, gotcha. And his nerve was intact, right? And uh, so that's a good thing. So in trauma and infections and stuff like that, we check for nerves a lot just to make sure they because nobody wants to not be able to pucker or kiss, right? Got to have full range of motion. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Especially Absolutely. Merla. <laughs> All right. Anybody out there? Any uh, any questions? I guess the lack of questions may be a sign that you were so thorough with your presentation that there is no confusion. I will tell you, I think it's a good time for you to put up the uh, coupon code for the Insta-Risa retractors. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So let me present here. Uh, right. I stopped presenting. Wonderful. All right, folks. So. Again, if you did have any questions, you use that activity button and go ahead and pop those in there. I'll get back to those before we before we wrap up here, just in case there's any un, uh, unanswered. So as, as Dr. Brocklov alluded to, we do have a, a special offer for everybody that's tuned in as a thank you for joining us for the Face the Future webinar. Uh, the Cheek Retractor Kits, a, we make these in three sizes. They're small, medium, and large. So the the kit for equipping your whole office is a set of six, two of each size. And now through Sunday at midnight Pacific time, you can get 20% off using code BROCK20. That's B-R-O-K-20. You can find these beautiful retractors with the nice uh, flange on the inside to pull the cheeks back and give you full view of the buckle corridor. And uh, these are excellent for... Uh, not only for Instaresa, they're great for photography, photogrammetry, uh, just photos in, in, in general. Um, you know, everything is visible. It really makes, makes the job easy to uh, document your cases. You can find these at instaresa.com slash retractors, or you can click the handy QR code that you see on the screen. And these are sterilizable, Dennis. Absolutely. Sterilizable. You can autoclave these and they don't turn into a paperweight which are the original ones we did didn't they didn't <laughs> not, not all materials hold up in the autoclave that's for sure. No, sure uh make sure you hop on and grab these that's a pretty decent discount and for those of you that are not a member of the instarisa tribe on whatsapp here's the qr code please come join us uh it's a community of uh folks that are looking for the best ways to serve more patients. Uh, we're talking about changing lives. We're talking about problem solving, uh, lots of sharing of knowledge, sharing of cases, uh, lots of beautiful deliveries on there. Uh, so please join us on WhatsApp with the Insta Tribe. 
And once again, we want to make sure you guys know coming soon, we'll have the Instaresa Face the Future podcast. So a little twist, we're doing the webinar, which is going to be a clinical focus and, and case presentations and the Face the Future podcast. We're still going to be talking about facially driven dentistry, but we're going to take a little more casual approach, have a little fun with it, conversation. Uh, it should be very educational and entertaining. So we'll keep you posted. And there'll be a discount of some sort, right? I'm sure there will. I'm sure there will. So stay tuned. Uh, All right. And we will we will give updates as they become available. So Dennis, thanks a lot. We will see you next month. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Brocklov. Fantastic presentation. And uh, one quick question we got here. Uh, okay. from Ryan Gertz, are you grabbing surgical consent the day before due to the patient taking the Valium the night before? Yes. Actually, most of the patients for full arch, uh, a week or so in advance, we have them come in and do the consents and take care of all the financial stuff. Wonderful, wonderful. Great question and great answer. So thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. All right. Uh, have a good night. on WhatsApp. And thanks again, Dr. Brocklov. Everybody have a great evening. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.